We're happy to have with us today Bill Ruain. Bill Ruain is not only our number one agent in our company, but he's consistently in the top three in Remax International in the entire network. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Absolutely. Thanks, James. So let's talk about supply of homes. Do you ever think we're going to see just a glut of homes uh, on the market, like we did in 2007, 2008, and back in the 90s, remember the 90s we right. had, but the 90s was more of a micro Southern California specific. We had the savings and loan debacle, and then all the aerospace companies consolidated exactly. and merged, and we saw a lot more homes on the market. But um, other than that, we see a low supply of homes. Yeah, and uh, originally I thought uh, when there was allowed all these homes you know, being converted for uh, uh, zoning for, uh, what would you call it, for the homeless and everything, that they were going to density and everything else. But those are apartments, which are your next buyers, ideally. So they really didn't affect the supply of the home demand. Right. And then what, so uh, traditionally what we see is new home builders, when lumber prices go up and interest rates go up and everything else becomes more expensive, their profit margins are... Uh, getting pretty thin. Right, right, right. And they're going to maybe pass on some projects that they would have taken advantage of when rates were lower. Correct. So what do you see about uh, what's happening in El Segundo with new homes? Do you see a lot of new construction? Owner, user. Not not builders. Builders have pulled back. Uh, you have a, a lot of them just building new homes versus buying a new house. So, so you do have owner, users. Of course, if you buy a home, you're going to want to make it your home and right, do, right. do things to it. Um, so the spec builders have pulled back a little bit? Quite a bit. Yeah, and it, I guess it's that mystery because when you build now, it's you know, a year, year and a half out. You, know? you have an election coming out in two years. You got a lot of different politics to uh, make a decision for a lot of the builders. Absolutely. And uh, it's also hard to find good flips now because there's a lot of, com- there has been a exactly. lot of competition. And I think if you have a really dilapidated home that comes out at or below interest uh, market rate, you're going to get a lot of demand. Right, and, and uh, you have so many people now that are all cash, or they do no loan or appraisal contingency, and that's where the builders used to have their advantage. Now they're, they're just one of many. That's right. You know? What do you see uh, out of all the buyers you work with? You know, traditionally, we were seeing about 25% cash deals. What do you see? About, it's still about the same. You still, you still got those people. I mean, you still have the people who try and pull the game, you know, all cash, and they want to bring their appraiser in, you know. <laughs> but uh, they, they still are removing their loan and appraisal contingencies. There's a lot of people with a lot of cash out there. Have right. you noticed right. that? Right, quite a bit. And where, are you seeing foreign money come into the United States as much as before the, the pandemic? And, and interesting, we're closed one today uh, with Peninsula Escrow, <laughs> that uh, uh, Marie Del Rey uh, was, uh, was from uh, China. And we got it through and we closed on time. And the other agent was really nervous on the other end because of the situation from a, from a foreign country. Oh, it's harder yeah. now to get money, transfer money into the United States than it has been traditionally. Exactly. So it's, uh, it, again, probably about one in 20 of my deals are foreign, more, maybe, maybe even 30. Uh, probably because, like, if you work Man Beach, I think PV, more common. I think Palos Verdes has a little bit more of a diverse culture, right, a right. lot of foreign money coming in. El Segundo seems to be a. Kind of a very, um, you know, people refer to it as Mayberry. Yeah, exactly. And it's, people that live there love it, and it's kind of hard. It's a lifestyle. And I have, a, I have nine homes on the market. Uh, six are, are people who have been there 25 years or more. Wow. So generations. So out of those nine sellers that are selling, how many are going to stay in the El Segundo area, and how many are actually leaving the area or leaving California? They're all uh, older, so they're, they're, a lot of them are retiring, uh, leaving California, that type of wow. thing. So not many are, are staying. So CAR, you, I mean, you sold uh, 100 homes last year, over 100. <laughs> and um, CAR came out with a statistic that 40% of homeowners that sold in California were leaving the state. What did you see out of your um, transactions last year? Probably about 20%. And I, I think at the very beginning, and again, it always has to do with politics, that, you know, all the people that say, hey, I'm going to leave if so-and-so wins or whatever, whoever wins, and uh, they leave. And, it's a, and, it's a, uh, and a lot of people moved out of the area because they could re- uh, work from home. And even though I suggested that they rent their house for one year, I did a disclaimer because most of them are my friends, 
And I said, hey, you don't know when they're going to call you back. And they were promised that they were not going to be called back to work, and now they are. And I heard so. a lot of people actually thought they would love the, to live up in the remote mountains, yeah. and they get there, and they're like, what? <laughs> Why did I make that decision? I hate it here. Let me go back. You know, it's exactly. nice for six months, eight months. A and vacation. Then you're like, a vacation. And now they're like, man, I, I miss my old lifestyle. Right. And you got some of them that have moved here that uh, where they moved to uh, Tennessee or Arizona. It's so hot there. Then now they're coming back down here just as a, like a break. Well, not only uh, a California lifestyle is fun, but it's the weather that yeah. makes it so wonderful here. Number one. It Number really one. is. Number one. It you know? never gets that hot as long as you're close to the beach. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sunny year round. Right. And I, I think... You would know better, but I think PV skyrocketed because so many people always want to live in PV, but it was so far away from work. We saw demand increase during the pandemic. You know, a lot of the people that commute from Palos Verdes to Century City or downtown LA, it's an hour each way, and right. that's two hours a day. Which is 40 and hours a week. now that you can work remotely and maybe go into the office once a week, yeah. once, that makes it affordable. It makes it wonderful. You have... Larger land, bigger homes, big views. Right, right. It's a it's a wonderful community. If you didn't have that commute, exactly. And I, I, I said the wrong math, but if uh, two hours a day is basically uh, forty hours a month, I mean, you might as well <laughs> work extra and, and get another job somewhere. <laughs> That's right. So, what do you see things doing um, the next in twenty twenty three next year? So, let's say we're in December. What's your forecast for, you know, what's going to happen? Are we going to see lower inventory? Are we going to see the same inventory? Let's say interest rates are about the same, maybe trickle down. They're, they're suggesting maybe 4.5% to 5% bouncing around, something like that next year. What do you think the market's going to do? We're still going to be steady. I think the South Bay, there's always going to be a demand. During the pandemic, we saw about 20 to 30% appreciation in 2020, 2021. This year, you know, it's tapering down to probably all things said and done, it'll be maybe eight percent appreciation. Which is incredible. what do you sug what do you predict twenty twenty three as far as appreciation? I still I still think we'll be about the five percent, and I, I stress to people they say, well, I'm just making five percent on my money, and, and and like you know, eighty percent of people do not pay all cash. You put twenty percent down, and you're making five percent on what the per on the purchase price. You're making a great return. A lot of return. <laughs> That's the power of leverage. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny because I'm, I'm, I'm still one of those guys that, you know, fiscally conservative, but if you can get a, a, a fixed rate for 10%, you know, a, a, for 10 years and it's cheaper and just like you're talking about, you can refinance at any time. So I, 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 you know, we were talking about this earlier, you know, interest rates come up, they come down, they come up. And if you time it, if you have to buy a house and you lock in a little bit higher interest rate, I think if you wait three or four years, rates will go down. Right. And if you time it right, you can call your lender if you're prepared and lock in that lower interest rate for a refinance. Right, and it's always good to, to have a good rapport with your lender, make sure you have everything up to date. Even though you may not have any intention of refinancing, if you're at 5% now and it goes down to three, you probably are gonna do it. And again, stressing, it only has to be for that one day. You don't have to have the interest rates fixed for 30 years before, or 30 days before you can refinance. That's a good point. Have a really strong relationship with your lender provide all your financials and so you're prepared for opportunities right. when they come up. Exactly. And again, being proactive like anything else is that can be the key on this because at the same time, that may just be the one day. It might be the midterms. It might be the next election. Who knows? Or, or as sad as it is, the worse the economy, the better the interest rates. So That's right. So what? tell us what's happening in the local uh, community of El Segundo. I know there's a lot of restaurants. It's turned into quite the fun, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, destination with restaurants and bars and uh, shops and retail. It's, what, it, it, what's happening there? It's amazing because on one side of PCH slash Old Sepulveda, it's uh, uh, 2050. Everything's ahead of it. they got all the aerospace companies, you know, just ahead of its time. And then and it's number two in the state for Fortune 500, uh, Fortune 500 companies in this little tiny city. Wow. And then on the other side, you got Mama D's who came came out to tell us kind of Rock and Brews got started there. Beyond Meat got started on Main Street. You know, oh, did it really? Yeah, so they're right next door to each other. So also going to Brewing Company is now nationwide. You know, I mean, it's just all in that 100 block of Main. That's so, great. And then they're having the Art Walk um, August 27th, and it's not plugged for Art Walk. We're not we're not involved in it per se. It's just the idea that it's about 4,000 people this year that they expect. 
and this from uh, uh, surrounding cities surrounding that are cities come that are, in. Oh, I'll you know, check kind, it out. kind of kind of different you know what I mean like so that's helping all the uh, uh, the restaurants and bars and everything else. And at the same time, Rock and Brews is allowed to be open until 12 at night and they close at nine or 10. It's just that sleepy city, you know? Interesting. Yeah. So you're involved in kind of the politics of El Segundo. What's, what's the master plan and what do they want to move forward? What, what's their master plan for the community? I think the, there's still a, a push uh, to keep uh, PCH on that side, all commercial, no residential, and this side, more traditional houses. Uh, and also a, a, a side trivia, that side of the PCH means they, that goes to Hawthorne High. It does not go to El Segundo. Oh, interesting. So we have a, a high school, Da Vinci High, and people from El Segundo cannot go to it. It's one of the most beautiful schools. It's designed for Hawthorne, Holly Glen, Del Air, Weisburn. Yeah, so yeah. that's pretty unique. El Segundo has a, a large commercial uh, area west of PCH. There's a, a bunch of commercial, and the, the Kings have a, a skating rink there. Yeah. There's a lot of professional. Um, Five. And then uh, Tell uh, me about the Chargers are moving their headquarters there. So you have the Lakers, the Chargers, the Kings, uh, the, the, uh, the rugby group that won. I, I'm terrible, I don't know rugby. But they got number one last year, moved to El Segundo. Um, and the, well, the, if you think about the location, uh, they're incredible. close to everything, and LAX is right there. And when, I, I think what happened with El Segundo, it blew up about four or five years ago uh, when the uh, LA Times came here. Because the LA Times was, you know, they got some pushback because they're in El Segundo and and they're, and they're supposed to be an LA Times building, but they had raised the rent allegedly. And, uh, but the guy from LA Times was saying, well, the LA Kings, the LA Lakers are in El Segundo. We're right next to them, and they are right next to them. So talk about the, you know, maybe the, the unspoken detriment of living in El Segundo. You have LAX, so you yeah. have jet planes 24-7 <laughs> landing and, and taking off. And then you got the Hyperion plant, right. which they had a big sewage spill. And there's, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in El Segundo. Just when the wind blows right, yeah. it's kind of a little bit stinky. Yeah, and you, all our negatives, are, again, I'm a realtor, so I flip it to be a positive. <laughs> we have the high rises on one side, the ocean, the uh, uh, Chevron, and the airport. At the same time, it keeps us isolated. It's a, it's a very small area, and it's very uh, uh, easy to control. And in, in that sense, it's like you know who's there, who's, who's not there. But going to Hyperion, the, in some ways, the best thing that happened to us was that Hyperion spill. It was terrible. Like I said, it was, uh, it was, the smell was for months and uh, everything else. But they found out all these uh, things that the, the managers weren't doing, the safety uh, inspections that came up. Just like, I mean, as bad as it's say, it's like a plane crash. All of a sudden, you, you regroup and you say, we want to prevent this you know, from happening again. And that's what the Hyperion's doing. That's great. You know? And talk about you, uh, crime. You said it, it's very isolated, and I know the police there are, they, are diligent about stomping out crime. What is the crime rate there? And it, we have the same crime as everyone else. We just have a lot less of it. And the new police chief was a cadet, so he started as a cadet. And, and he's just a very, uh, uh, very proactive. He, he's a motivator. And you know, there's a lot of pushback because of the DA. But he, he did that whole speech about, it, it's not your job what the DA does. Your job is to be proactive, prevent crime, and, and then, you know, it was just kind of neat. I, I just, it, it gives you a little more, uh, that's, a, a better feeling. That's you know. great. And since he was a cadet, he's pretty connected with the community, I'm sure. And what's really nice, he respects the cadets. He respects the lower officers. You know, when I say that, to, uh, because he was there. Versus someone who may have just been a golden that's handshake. And, yeah, exactly. That's great. <laughs> so. Well, wonderful. I mean, you're a wealth of knowledge, and... Thank you for coming in today at the Skyliner Studio. <laughs>